So Eric had a great session, and it's a um, difficult session to, session to top up in any way. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm not going to talk about innovation. I'm not going to talk about what anyone can do. I'm just going to share the story of how I believe small teams are going to change the world. It's no longer going to be big governments. It's no longer going to be big enterprises. But it'll be small teams, individuals like uh, Elon Musk who are going to change this world. Eric talked about disruptive innovation. Any innovation uh, which is disruptive, which is looking for new products, new destinations, new ways to engage with the community, all have to be steeped in imagination. He said, don't go and ask your customer what they want because they don't have a clue. That's because it has to be the imagination of one person who does something or wants to do something which is earth changing, something which, after which the, the, the world is never the same. The world will change. There are few such defining moments in the history of mankind. Uh, I've picked some which appeal to me the most. I'm just going to show you some of them. Uh, this is the clicker. of Elon, of SpaceX. How many of you all woke up, at, I'm sure it was middle of the night here, to see Falcon Heavy launch? No? No one really woke up. And for me, that is the most defining moment we have today, to see those thrusters come back. And, and every time I see this video, I get goosebumps to say he's redefining where we can access space, how we'll do space exploration, what the world is going to be. Of course, there's a Tesla that's flying towards Mars. And we could look at that as space debris, or we could look at that as cocky Elon. But either way, he is changing the way the world is today. Carl Sagan said that we began as wanderers, and we are wanderers still. We're not supposed to be species that are you know, contained within Earth. And I think that's what takes us forward. That's what makes us explore new, new destinations. Right from when ships used to go out in England to either look at the new world, find new islands, find new countries, or fall off the edge of the Earth because the Earth was, was uh, flat. Right up to 50 years ago, when a group of folks Mighty nations came together to put massive resources to get us started on this journey of conquering the next frontier. And that's when NASA uh, and uh, the Americans landed on the moon in the 60s and 70s. To today, where you have a one man, unreasonable man, with a very powerful dream, who's trying to change the world and change space exploration. I'm going to share the story of a small team based out of India. We're based out of Bangalore which is an equally unreasonable team because reason has no place to play when you're trying to change something, when you're trying to redefine what small teams can do, when you're trying to redefine the access and the way we live going forward, and a team with an equally powerful dream. How does it start? I mean, and, and I'd love to make this as interactive as possible. Anyone have a crazy dream here, something that you didn't do, which you wanted to do? Anyone? No, no, no crazy dreams. Innovation team here, yeah. yes. Oh, I have to tell you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you didn't know that. Me, I didn't know that. Okay, <laughs> but I, I'll go ahead. My, my crazy dream, uh, dream was not related with fragrances or with creativity and innovation, but it was more related with music. And uh, my crazy dream was to 
uh, it is still is, is to play with Eric Clapton on stage. To play with Eric Clapton. And why didn't you make that happen? Um, well, life kind of happens. Life takes over. That's the one sentence we hear. Life takes over. Sentence number two, which I hear, is people say, people will think I'm insane. I can't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to play with Eric Clapton and make that happen. That's the second thing that we hear. And the third thing is, it's not the right time. I don't have the right resources. I don't have the right, I'm not in the right place to be able to do something that's earth shattering. We woke up one day and said, hey, we're going to the moon. And the first thought was, oh God, are people going to say, are you crazy? I mean, are you a rocket scientist? No. Do you have money? No. Do you have a team? No. Do you have a spacecraft that's built? No. What are you doing? We're going to the moon. But we found an anchor in the competition, and that gave us credibility to say, oh, we're going to the moon because it's a competition, not because we're crazy. So this was the X Prize competition that was launched in 2007. It required private teams to build and land a spacecraft on the moon. You had to move 500 meters. You had to send images back as evidence of doing so. In 2007, when this was launched, man hadn't thought about space after the 60s and 70s. Nobody had gone. It was not top of anyone's conversation. Today, it's the time for new space. Everyone's talking. America's going back to the moon. China's going back to the moon. Japan, Europe, India are going back to the moon. And then you have Elon Musk, who has finally decided that Mars is too far, and he's going back to the moon also. They changed the narrative of how this world can look at the moon and how can we access it. They had 30 teams that registered from across the world. We're the only ones from India. It was the usual suspects. Three-fourth was the Americas and Europe and one for the rest of us poor third world countries. And we're the only one from India. And as of last year, there were only five teams that were left on the competition. Two American, one Japanese, one Israeli, and one Indian. Any Americans here? So I must tell you that the American teams have no hope in hell. There was no way they were going to work. The main competition was between the Israelis and us. And the Japanese team is flying aboard our spacecraft because they don't have a spacecraft. They just have a way to explore the lunar surface. So they've collaborated with us. So it was basically between these two teams. This competition officially shuts in 24 days. And if any of us were winning and any of us were on the moon right now, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in a command center watching the spacecraft. So this competition is going to shut down without a single winner declared because there was no team that made it in time. We were the last ones to register. We registered in 2011 when the competition had nearly uh, closed registration. So it's been a seven year journey for us. But what does this do? What happens to competitions? What happens to things that get ignited and don't have, a, don't have fruition? Is this failure? Is this how Eric was talking about? Is failure of the competition? But it looked at building small teams which are going to disrupt the world. That's Team Indus. We're a team. We're the largest team. We're a team of close to 80, 80 engineers. The rest are 40, 50 engineers who are building space missions to go and explore the lunar surface, to go and explore Mars. This is something that we couldn't have dreamt about a couple of years ago. It would have to be governments with massive resources, all dedicated towards that one outcome to be able to even think of this. So I'm going to talk about one of those teams, and that's us. We're building a spacecraft to land on the moon. Uh, we, we, were close to, we were pretty much close to being ready. We should have been launching right now. But again, in all startups, failure comes in. And you figure out what to do with that, and you keep moving on. And we're going to launch in another six to nine months. Any idea how many countries have landed on the moon? You're one of the few, few people in the world. I've, I say this with audiences of 500, 1,000, and nobody reads my slides. Absolutely no one. And I invariably get seven countries, right? From Kenya to Hong Kong, everybody's been to the moon. But no, only three countries have. The Americans went in the 60s and 70s. And the Chinese went in 2013. So when this competition had launched, absolutely nobody had gone back. And now you have a whole array of small teams out of small countries, big countries, who are going to go back and do this. So these are the artifacts we have. There are three elements to our, our mission. The first one there is the rover, which will explore the lunar surface. The first rover is ours. Her name is Ika, and she will be the first Indian on the moon. So finally, we'll have a woman on the moon. 
Uh, next to Ika is Serato, which is the Japanese rover which is flying aboard our spacecraft. Ika is the first of her kind um, small size rover. Any guesses how heavy were the American and the Russian and the Chinese rovers? Guess. 150 was the Chinese, it was a, a little over 135. The American and the Russians were like mini cars. They were close to 650 kilos. Our rover is seven kgs. So it comes with her own challenges. We've done a lot of testing on the wheels. I mean, we spent, out of these five years that we've intensely started work, we've spent all five years just trying to figure out what are the right wheels for her to be kept, be able to get enough traction on the surface of the moon. So not only will she be the first woman on the moon, she'll be the lightest rover on the moon. She fits into our spacecraft. This is a fully qualified spacecraft. It's been through every test. If we were to put avionics into it today, it is ready to fly. It'll be 650 kgs when we take off, uh, 210 kgs when we land, because the rest of that is all? We, we, we can communicate, all? Fuel, it's all propulsion. So, and when she lands, she's gonna carry, uh, the, the spacecraft will have both of these rovers on it. Um, for a few people, I'm guessing, would you know Hindi? Few people know Hindi. Um, the name of our rover is Ika, E-C-A. Any guesses what could that stand for? It's a Hindi phrase. It basically means it's difficult. Ek choti si asha, which means a small dream, uh, because she represents the hope of every individual out there who thinks that we don't need to be big, we don't have to have the right resources, we don't need to be a huge multinational to be able to do something earth shattering. And she fits into our spacecraft, which is called again a Hindi phrase, hum honge kamiyab, which is that we will be successful. So here we are, a set of people who embarked on this journey with no aerospace background, no finances, with a dream, which was, the, which was the rover, which was a small hope, and the determination to make it happen. The third element is what we buy. This is not an Uber ride, but it's pretty much the same. Costs a lot more than a regular Uber ride. But this is a rocket launcher where you need to be able to break away from Earth's gravity. This ride is 15 to 20 minutes, that just helps you get into lower Earth orbit. After that, our spacecraft takes over and does the journey from Earth to Moon. Any guesses how much does a rocket launcher 15, 20 minute ride cost? Remember, we are all startups bootstrapped. So how much do you think that costs? 20 million? 20 million? For US, yeah, 20 million US, anyone else? So it's gonna cost us anywhere between, and we're not allowed to share the exact numbers, between 40 and 75 million. So that's how much it costs, and that's why private enterprises not get into space exploration. But if we were to do it, and what Elon has managed to do today is repeatedly bring that cost down by getting reusable. So now he'll come closer to 25 to 30 million because he's got reusable uh, spacecraft, uh, launch vehicles coming into play. So what does a uh, launch vehicle leave us? It leaves us very close to the Earth's, uh, next to the Earth, and then we get into something called a translunar trajectory, which is four to five days between Earth and Moon, and this is our spacecraft doing that journey. At the end, when we're close to the uh, lunar uh, orbits, we have to do a very specific maneuver so that you can get captured in the lunar orbit. You do that too hard or too strong, you'll impact against the lunar surface. You do that too weak, and then we'll have to come back and pretend we were a Mars mission, because we're gonna miss the moon completely. <laughs> so we get captured in S1, and then we keep reducing our speed so that we're able to go to S2, S3, and finally S4. S3 is where we park. We can park there with minimal fuel consumption for as long as we like. So we park there, it's 100 by 100, it's the only circular orbit, everything else is highly elliptical. We park there till we're ready to launch, uh, ready to descend. We descend at dawn. Any ideas why? Why, we, why would we look to descend on the lunar surface at dawn? So you can see where you're going. So as sensors can see where, we, where they're going, yes. Why else? Communication. communication, I can communicate in the dark also. Temperature, I can, yeah. Temperature as in the night survival will be difficult. You need nuclear power for that. Why else? Why don't? Sorry? 
Absolutely, because we are solar powered. So the rover needs solar power, the spacecraft needs an element of solar power, which is why we go as close to dawn as possible. That is to maximize our surface operations. Our first launch does not, we don't have the capability to do a night survival. The temperatures are so dramatic between day and night. So we're gonna only do day operations. How many days would our operations be? This is grade one science. How many days would our operations be if we are solar powered and therefore we are maximizing one moon day? Sorry? As long as you want. As long as you want, one moon day. We have to survive one moon day. How, how many days? It says 14 days. It says 14 days, yes, my screen says everything. But it is 14 days because you see the moon. You, you, you go from full moon to no moon in 14 days. So that's as long as we have for our surface operations. Descent is the most critical part. When we're ready to descend, we go 12 kilometers above the lunar surface and begin descent. Till that moment, every instruction, every maneuver, everything on the spacecraft is commanded and controlled by us in our command center. We have a much cooler than NASA command center where we invite people to come in, be a part of it, because as was mentioned, it's, we're making it as inclusive as possible. How many of you have been and watched a live space mission, exploration mission? No, you can't. You have? In a command center? No, not in the right now, in NASA. Oh, in, okay. So, this, this would be an opportunity where we'd let people come in, you sit there with the team that's built this and watch the mission go live. The last 15 minutes is descent, completely autonomous. The spacecraft has to attitude correct itself, it has to avoid hazards, it has to do minimal site selection, and it has to land on its own. It's going from 1.7 kilometers a second to zero velocity in 15 minutes. Why is that completely autonomous? We're not out of contact, but because we're very far. So a radio signal takes 1.3 seconds to, one to 2 seconds to come one way, a couple of seconds for human intervention, a couple of seconds to go back. By that time, the spacecraft has moved too far. That is the most critical part of our journey. While we've built this mission on first principles, we've done a lot of learning from previous space missions. So we've learned from the Indian Space Research Agency's missions, we've learned from the NASA missions, from the Russian missions. The one part where we have absolutely no data is descent. So we went to Lockheed Martin because they were the ones who were part of the first mission and said, can we speak to some of the folks who planned descent because we'd like to learn. And they said, ah, uh, they're long gone. We said, okay, can we see some of the documentation? We didn't document at that time. And while that felt really odd to say why, I know we don't document much, so I can understand the chaos that way they were going through. And we work very closely with scientists from the Indian Space Research Agency, scientists who have retired, uh, but we, India has never landed. So there is no heritage data for us to learn from. So that is the trickiest part of our mission. This is some of our, um, some of our, uh, our qualifications. This first one here is, it's a model of the spacecraft. So the spacecraft is 210 kgs when we land. That structure is 210. We drop it, we have sensors all around, we measure it and we keep evaluating. The rover, um, this, our rover is, so when you, when you look at oh, going over obstacles or into craters, usually you can go to the radius of your tire. Our rover is the double the tire of its wheels because it's been uh, designed in such a way. It's called a rocket handle, um, a rocket arm, which means at any given time, all four wheels are always on the lunar surface. The third one is how we looked at planning uh, the which is exactly the same and gravity on that on that lunar surface. On top we have our so that the camera moves itself and pushes it on. And we run millions and millions of these algorithms to be able to actually finally do this. 
There are lots more tests we have. I just picked up some. At the end, innovation comes from, sure, the technologies you build. But it's the process, it's the people, it's the team that comes together. This gentleman here is our first employee. He came and joined us straight out of college, hadn't got his results. He was the first person who knew aerospace. Everybody else in the founding team had no clue what aerospace was. He walked in, 21-year-old, and said, I'm going to build the blueprints of this mission. I'm going to be a part of it and um, create a company, employ me, don't pay me because you're a startup, you have no money, but I'm going to make this happen. He's now, and this was in 2012. He's now spent a little over five years with us, still very much there. The original design this child did when he was 21 of the trajectory of how many orbits around the Earth, how many orbits around the Moon, when you do propulsive burns, is still what we use today, 10 to 15% variance after having a dozen retired uh, scientists who built moon missions in the past evaluate, vet it, it's still the same. That tells you that you don't need to be a 40-year-old or a 65-year-old scientist. You could be a 21-year-old straight out of college and still be able to go to the moon. This is our team today. It largely comprises of, uh, we have two average ages actually. One average age is 25, kids one to five years out of college. The other average age is 65, and these are our retired scientists from the Indian Space Research Agency. Now, most people where I speak, they say, my god, that must just kill your company. But that's what made, gives us our secret sauce. We are able to temper the energy, passion, new way of thinking, impatience of the young ones, and match it with the competence, I've been there and done that before, and experience of the retired scientists and been able to build this mission in less than five years. I don't think with either of the two groups would we, have to do that, would we be able to do that. Because the older ones would always want to follow the same traditional I've done that before path. And the younger ones have absolutely no respect for what's been done before. A lot of it, of course, comes from then who supports you. We've attracted people who've and sorry, that's Flipkart there. In India, Flipkart and Amazon are always <laughs> at loggerheads. We're very close to tying up with Amazon, too. Uh, these are visionaries, but individuals, again, not organizations, people who came and said, we'd support you either with technical expertise or with finances. It's a very, very expensive mission. In the beginning, it had no return on investment. It had no reason for people to come and invest and put their money into it. And these are the folks who brought us this far. Uh, we've spent close to 22 million already on this mission. We'll have to spend a close to another 50 million before we move forward. But these are folks who came in their individual capacities to say, you're a small team. You all are individual doing something. We'll support it. Let's make this happen. <coughs> Earlier, and when Eric was saying that, I was thinking, you know, what would I add to it? Um, and no, we don't love failures, but we've had our share of huge amount of failures. It's been five years into an industry where we didn't know anything, building it from scratch, building it with a young team, and we've had tons of failures. So I have to move a little faster. I'm not gonna to take too much time on the failures because my five minutes are up. But if anyone wants to hear it, I think the biggest thing that kept us going and has kept a small team like us surviving is to be able to face failures and look for opportunities in every one of those challenges that came. The biggest challenge we've had was till January this year, we were flying, our rocket launcher was with the Indian Space Research Agency. You could build the best spacecraft, but if you don't have a rocket launcher, you can't leave Earth's, uh, Earth's surface. And we were flying aboard the Indian Space Research Agency's rocket launcher, which got terminated for us in January. And it was only when we said it was terminated that the competition also closed down, because I think we were the forerunners in this competition. It was five years of building towards something that, we, that you put, and five years in team industry is like 35 years outside, it's like dog years. And then everything came crashing down with that one thing of not having the contract. But it's about how do, you, how do you redevelop, how do you grow, and we're now talking to Elon Musk, we're talking to a few other agencies, and we're gonna go back, and that's why our launch has been delayed another six to nine months. We've built collaborative platforms on which people could come together, engage, because 
When people come enable you to go forward, we thought it, we had to go and engage the rest of the world. We launched this competition, and it was for students across the globe. Remember, nothing has been tested on the lunar surface for the last 50 years. These were students who were asked, if you build, a, build an experiment, we'll fly it and test it for you on the moon. The youngest team is a 15-year-old. In, in a span of two years, he's imagined, designed, and built an experiment, which he wants tested on the moon. It will get tested and come back with data. This is building innovators around the world. We have another team from Peru. It's a team of three young girls uh, in a country that does not have a space program does not have any support of women in STEM. And they've got an amazing one which is looking at um, creating photosynthesis using cyanobacteria. Some really, really interesting ones. I'm going to skip over them. This is us. Uh, till, till, till the end of last year, it was a, a journey which was just about the competition. Now that the competition has closed down, we're going to just go back to the moon repeatedly uh, reducing cost, making it more accessible to people, increasing accuracy. In the next five years, we have seven launches planned to be able to, to keep this interest in the moon going. The, the aim of this story is to say that it doesn't take the right resources, it doesn't take big teams to make anything. The future is you. It just takes you standing up and saying, I can make this happen. And um, I was in a talk yesterday, and somebody asked me to say, this seems like the audacity of hope. And audacity of hope has, is a double-edged sword. It is the ability to hope, to even think that big. Can I sing with Eric Clapton? Is my dream that big? Can I dream that big? But it's the other way also, which says, who the hell are you to think that way? How do you have the audacity to think that you can go to the moon? And to be able to sustain or build something big, build a moonshot, you need to be able to do both to sustain yourself. This is a program that's attracted people from all walks of life. We've had artists come and want to be a part of it. This is not about space for scientists. None of us are scientists. We've had artists, we've had writers, we've had dancers and singers who want to be a part of this. And I'm going to show you a small video. It's of an artist. He's a very renowned artist in India. He's a music composer. He heard about us and just was awestruck with the story, came and saw the spacecraft and the rover, and he wanted to compose a song, which is a tribute to the spirit of what we're doing. You may not understand a lot of the words, because this is in Hindi, and I'm sure all of you have heard some Bollywood music, and this is as Bollywood as you can get. But the reason I want you to see it is because I'm not representative of Team Indus. I want you to see the team. I've put in a lot of images, real images, of the team, of the facility, so that you'd get an idea of who this team is. The words of the song basically say that if your dream is not an impossible dream, it's not a dream. If you're not walking on a less trodden path, you're never going to find new destinations. If it takes stubbornness bordering on foolhardiness to make something happen, so be it. You've got to look out of your window, and there's a whole world out there. I'll just play this song. If you can have the volume up.
जलना है सिद्ध है तो फिर सिद्ध ही सही फलक से आगे बढ़ना है